Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, welcome to part two of this investment dialogue series brought to you by the uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange in partnership with the Business Day and Financial Mail. My name is Fifi Peters and excited to be back with you to moderate the session this morning. Uh, we continue to look at the uh, financial advisor and the ever-changing role of this investment professional. Uh, part one, for those of you who missed it, uh, it happened last week and if I can just share a few takeaways from that session. We looked at uh, how the role of this financial advisor, of course, is being impacted by the uh, transformation of technology, as is everything else. But also what came out in that discussion was the fact that this was not necessarily at the expense of the human touch. Uh, we also focused on the uh, young and up-and-coming and hungry and enthusiastic millennials and Gen Zers who enjoy a certain level of autonomy when it comes to navigating the financial markets. But they also do require some financial advice, so just in a different form. These individuals are looking for a financial coach. We uh, touched on the growth of the uh, global exchange traded funds industry as well as the local ETF industry with around 85 products now listed on the JSC, a uh, value or market value of over 140 billion rand. And what came out quite strongly was the fact that more and more clients, probably your clients, are demanding ETFs in their portfolios. And so we'll uh, pick up from this point as we look at how to equip you as financial advisors with the right tools and skills for portfolio construction using exchange traded funds. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you. We had quite an active audience uh, this time last week and we hope that you can continue that level of activity. Feel free to share any comments that you may have or any questions in the chat and we will answer as many as time does allow. Uh, without further ado though, I would like to welcome our first speaker for this morning. Mr. Tato Matsafu, who is the head of primary markets at the JSC, to give us the official welcome address. Good morning, Tato. Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to join you today as we take a closer look at ETFs and explore ways in which we can equip financial advisors with the right tools. While preparing for today's discussion, I thought about how ETFs and how we in the financial services industry position them with clients. Today's topic raises pertinent questions about how a financial advisor can construct an optimal investment portfolio for their clients using ETFs. This is intriguing and I'm certain that when the first ETF was launched on the GSE two decades ago, few may have cautiously thought that would be where we are today, with 85 ETFs with a market cap of over 114 billion rand listed on the GSE. We now have local and international ETFs across asset classes, ranging from equity, fixed income, property, multi-asset class ETF, is ESG themed ETFs and commodity ETFs to name but a few. As it has been said so many times before, we are in the information age and more and more people do not have time as they are overloaded. It is therefore easy for a first timer or an inexperienced investor to become overwhelmed with, with information and choice. Although the ETF market uh, continues to mature, we are still at an early stages of innovation when we compare to our global peers. ETFs are now at a stage where just about every market segment offers plenty of choices. A recent report by EY titled, Can ETF Scale New Heights in an Unfamiliar Environment? highlights that competition among ETF issuers falling fees and margins and entry of new players are key drivers to suggest intensified rivalry in this space. Furthermore, EY identified that in order to improve ETF distribution, many ETF issuers were looking to take advantage 
of remote advice and online sales to scale up their digital capabilities. The role of the advisor is therefore no less intertwined in this ETF growth story. In conclusion, it is my firm belief that as we engage in these informative discussions, we'll also realize that the ETFs will continue to grow in leaps and bounds and will further become a compelling investment instrument of choice for many investors. On behalf of the JSE, I'd like to extend our appreciation to all the experts that are part of today's discussion as we collectively work towards growing the ETF industry. I thank you all. Over to you, Fifi. Thanks so much, uh, Tato. And yeah, so let's uh, get into the discussion right now, uh, looking at those tools, but also taking a closer look at exchange traded funds themselves, as we have heard. We've seen a lot of growth and we're expecting a lot of growth to happen in uh, the, the road or rather in the future. Uh, so I do have the uh, speakers joining me on stage. All COVID-19 protocols have been observed, of course. Gentlemen, good morning. I will begin on my far right with um, Mr. Morris Madiba, who is the Managing Director of Cloud Atlas Investing. It is Africa's premier exchange traded fund issuer. Uh, seated next to him is Mr. Gareth Stobey, the Managing Director of Core Shares, a leading South African passive investment management business. And then right next to me here on the left, we have uh, Mr. Grant Locke, who is head of Outvest, an online investment services firm. Uh, quite the diversification we do have on this panel, uh, gentlemen. Uh, very happy to be the outlier here. Uh, <laughs> Jokes aside, your respective organizations have contributed to the growth in the local ETF industry that we have seen in the past uh, two decades, as we've heard from Tato. That is when the first ETF or the first instrument was listed here on the JC. But could you uh, begin with a brief description about your organizations for the uh, viewers who might be uh, hearing about them for the first time today? And uh, perhaps also just uh, give us a taste of the kind of product offerings that you a gentleman do bring to the market uh, gareth beginning with you okay thanks fifi hi everyone uh, so the core shares brand was launched roughly six years ago uh, we have nine exchange traded funds uh, trading on the jsc uh, spanning a number of different asset classes so from global equity global property through to local equity um, and local property and then we've got a few specific strategies like dividends for instance uh, that we also focus on. Uh, we've certainly traveled a road in terms of promoting the merits of ETFs and how they can be used in portfolios and in particular how they can meet uh, particular outcomes. Um, outside of the ETF uh, business, we also run conventional unit trusts which also track uh, indices um, and we integrate with various fintech platforms like the platform that, that uh, Grant runs. Mm -hmm. uh, Grant, then perhaps over to you. I was trying to really get a sense of uh, Outfest. I don't know, you're a robo-advisor, but not quite yet because there's still kind of an element of a human touch. Just uh, tell us a little, about, a little bit about Outfest. Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Grant and I'm the head of Outfest. Outfest is a robo-advisor and we're one of South Africa's only regulated, automated advisors. And we have created a solution to help people achieve their outcomes, effectively making the world of investing more certain, helping them forecast and achieve those objectives across a range of different needs, retirement, tax-free savings account, forthcoming global product that we're working on core shares with at the moment. We don't only work direct to consumer, we also help financial advisors scale their practices using our technology. And effectively what we do is we help an advisor set and upfront advice, manage their investment plans for their clients using an outcomes-based philosophy. So it's really about using technology and ETFs are a critical part of us helping that advisor create a low cost, efficient portfolio that is well diversified to help their clients achieve their objectives. All right, thanks. And uh, last but not least, Morris, in July, I think you brought the 83rd ETF onto the JSC with uh, uh, the, the, sovereign, the African Sovereign Bond ETF. And you've also just listed two ETFs in Botswana. So you've been quite yeah. busy. Uh, but tell us a little bit about uh, Cloud Atlas. Yeah, thank you, Fifi. And good morning to everybody out there. Uh, my name is Maurice, the Managing Director of Cloud Atlas Investing. We are predominantly have cast our gaze on the African markets and we offer 
exposure to uh, what is available in Africa from an equity perspective with our first ETF that came out about four years ago called the Big 50. And our new ETF, as Fifi had said, which is an Africa sovereign bond fund. As I've said, you know, we're focusing on Africa predominantly as an as a issuer. We do have a view of international markets and we apply a rules-based investing methodology for us to achieve more predictable outcomes when it comes to these international markets. And we started to distribute our ETF in, in other markets like Botswana. Um, there's a few where we're going into now, also Nigeria, um, and also international markets like Luxembourg. So we're really exporting South African ETFs uh, from this market into, <coughs> into other markets from, from this point. All right. All right. Thank you for the introductions. Very brief. But we are here to uh, discuss tools, right, to d uh, equip the uh, audience as financial advisors with tools to use ETFs in the best possible way. So therefore, uh, Grant, let's get into that uh, discussion. Or rather, let me actually kick off with Gareth. Uh, what then would you say, uh, Gareth, is the emerging role of the ETF strategist? What <coughs> does this look like? So an ETF strategist is a new... Um, way that advisors can add value in a, in a client's life because, I mean, if you think about the ETF market, and, and, and let's rewind sort of the 20 years that we've now had in our local market. Mm -hmm. When ETFs first burst onto the scene, they were very much positioned as this kind of product that you could chip away at, put 300 rand a month into a savings mm -hmm. plan and, and build up a, a um, body of wealth over time. And that's a perfectly good way to, to save, and we would certainly advocate for, for for clients to take that uh, approach. But if you look at it now, with some 80-odd products in the market, it's quite daunting for a client to mm -hmm. you know, go onto one of these technology platforms. They're interested in ETFs, and then they look, and, then, and they're just overwhelmed by this huge list of, of products. Even when they go into one particular asset class, like South African equity shares, for instance, there's loads of different indices, um, and it, it can be quite daunting for uh, first-time users of ETFs. So what an ETF strategist is, is a financial advisor who has positioned themselves to be an expert in the field of ETFs. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, financial advisors, particularly in our market, have typically given advice on uh, traditional unit trusts. Um, but given that there's so much excitement and so much interest in the ETF market, for advisors to also have the added skill of being able to advise clients on the, the optimum uh, mix of ETFs mm -hmm. has become a whole new area of growth within the uh, financial advisor market. It's, it's very small in South Africa. I can only think of a handful of financial advisors who consider themselves ETF strategists. Mm -hmm. Noreen, if this is someone you had on your last show, would, would probably describe yourself as an ETF strategist. She puts um, a model portfolio together of ETFs to meet a client's goal or client's outcome. So, so it, it's, it's, yeah, it's an evolution of kind of the financial advisor uh, role and it gives them an extra, um, uh, you know, arrow in their quiver, so to speak, in terms of the types of services they provide uh, in the market. So then would you say that uh, it's incumbent on uh, all financial advisors presently to perhaps uh, think of themselves as future ETF strategists? Do it, does everyone need to be going in this direction? I, I think it's definitely an opportunity for financial advisors out there who would like to differentiate their, their skill set. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it, it's somewhat contrary to a broader macro trend in the financial advice market. And, and that broader macro trend in the advice market is for advisors actually to focus less on product selection and more on the advice component where where you know, contemporary thinking would say that, you know, and you spoke about in your last show, behavioral coaching around how one um, interacts with their savings is perhaps the more important part of the advice process and selecting investment products is, is somewhat of a secondary process and often advisors ask other consultancy firms or multi-managers to, to help them with that process. So it's a little bit of a departure from that macro trend, I suppose. But um, nevertheless, it is definitely something that advisors can think about in terms of how they differentiate themselves in the market to be experts at working with these more contemporary type, uh, type funds. And you know, they can still work with those consultants who are putting together model portfolios and, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, but Grant, just on uh, portfolio construction, as it were, and just... Uh, 
how you do things and how you construct portfolios uh, using ETFs to uh, minimize risk, for instance? <clears throat> so I think, I mean, if you go back up a step, I mean, an ETF is effectively a tracks an index. And really, it's actually the index itself that sort of we're using as a way to sort of efficiently construct portfolios. So what we effectively do in our case is that we use an index of indices. The proxy is the way that you think about it is that in the olden days, we, we have a fund of funds approach where we use different, at, different asset managers to help us build a portfolio. What we've done, and we've worked closely with CoreShares on this and S&P Dow Jones indices, is create an index of indices. And those indices have a representation for the asset class that we're trying to track. Yeah. And by doing that, you've got quite a lot of control over the asset allocation of the client portfolio. Now, how you implement that, there's lots of ways to do that. And I think you know, a model portfolio of ETFs is a highly efficient way of gathering very well diversified exposure with a high degree of control. And that's what an index does. The way that we do it is obviously we have an index that we've created with S&P Dow Jones and then CoreShares tracks that index of indices. And that's, for us, that's incredibly important for automated advice. Mm -hmm. It's actually critical to make sure that we can prove suitability, but that might be another discussion. All right, maybe we'll have time to get into it a little later. But Morris, uh, given the uh, exposure that you uh, have as Cloud Atlas, particularly on uh, the rest of the continent, African markets, just give us a sense of how you use ETFs uh, and you maximize the efficiencies of ETFs in uh, portfolio construction. Yeah, so if you look at uh, your financial advisors and, and what they have to deal with, as Gareth had said, it's almost a two-part uh, approach where half of their job or most of their job should be really understanding what the client requires and what the client is trying to solve for when investing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part should be how do you select then these ETFs to, to achieve those outcomes. So um, in our discussions at the business, we usually talk about this uh, efficient frontier. So how do you then construct or plot um, the selection of ETFs, as, as Grant has said, in a way that is almost an indice of indices but what components then do you feed into that? So um, we look at Regulation 28 as a good model uh, for, for what ETFs or what portfolios could potentially look like. And you know, you've got your exposure to equities, foreign markets, local markets, bonds, um, and other investments, including infrastructure now, which is, which is coming on board. And so what we focused on really is the Africa segment of that, because Africa is still a disintegrated market. So you're looking at uh, if, if you were to look at ETFs listed, the JSC has a lot of local equity ETFs, whereas other African exchanges have almost no local equity ETFs, local bond ETFs, etc. So what we're really trying to achieve for is to give uh, financial advisors, investors, and funds the ability to deploy capital into the rest of Africa and make use of their Regulation 28 allowance, uh, potentially, and then also be able to get access to a variety of markets as opposed to thinking of Africa as this one place where you can put your money. We're making that more of a reality by having a combination of countries and a combination of sectors. So our new fund, yeah. Yeah. So our new fund as I was gonna say, is, is a little bit unique or a little bit of a tangent from, from our existing sphere of products in the sense that it offers euro bonds so this is a fixed income product which is still uh, Africa centric because the governments issuing these euro bonds are African governments. But I mean it is paying phenomenally high yields. So we're able to achieve more sustainable and government guaranteed uh, outcomes in that investment portfolio. And it's a complement to what we have on the equity side. So we're really trying to solve for Africa across these asset classes, equity, uh, fixed income, infrastructure, commodities, etc. I just wanted to add, I mean, <clears throat> I mean if, in, in terms of Regulation 28, one of the bonuses you get for offshore is by a allocating to, to African, or, um, uh, African markets, mm -hmm. and you can use an ETF incredibly easily to do that. And I would say that it's a, you know, it, you know where we were to change the index of index indices allocations, it would definitely be an ETF that we would use 
to track the African markets. Definitely a strong consideration for us. Right. Accessibility, uh, gentlemen, if we just touch on that issue and just uh, talk about how accessible the ETF universe is uh, for the investment community. Uh, Gareth, if you take that one. Sure. So I think ETFs are very accessible to everyone uh, out there on the streets. I mean, there are a number of uh, stockbroking and online platforms available that one can go on and buy ETFs. I mean, to just name a couple of easy equities, for instance, Standard Bank Online, F&B, mm -hmm. and so forth. All of these different online stockbroking platforms that are very user-friendly, where one can create an account and, and simply put together a portfolio of, of ETFs. Where the market is currently struggling is um, in the financial advisor space. Now, traditionally in South Africa, financial advisors have given advice on unit trusts rather than on shares. And because they've been giving advice on unit trusts, the industry has created an administration environment that is conducive just for unit trusts. So if you go and see a financial advisor, and let's say, for instance, they're using the, uh, the Alan Gray uh, Lisp. The financial advisor will say, okay, I'm going to put some of your money with Alan Gray on the Alan Gray platform, but I'm also going to put some money with Coronation, and I'm going to put some money with, uh, I don't know, Sunlamp, for, for argument's sake. And the advisor will then come back to the client with this aggregated report to show the, the client how they've done, what the returns have looked like, and so forth. Now, that whole administration environment uh, at the moment doesn't include ETFs, the traditional administration environment that financial advisors across the country use, because that administration environment was built for unit trusts rather than building for ETFs. Mm -hmm. And so we sit with this precarious situation at the moment where, on the one hand, ETFs are incredibly available, but they're available in one particular ecosystem, the stockbroking e ecosystem. Sure. The other ecosystem, which is the traditional financial advisor ecosystem, actually isn't linking up particularly well with, with um, uh, ETFs. And it's been one of the very frustrating barriers of entry for the ETF market. So that's why when clients are sitting with their financial advisor, the financial advisor most often isn't putting ETFs forward because the ETFs don't sit in that administration ecosystem. So um, are there indications that this is uh, likely to change anytime well, soon well and should it? It, it, it should change, and we hope it's going to change. We thought that it would have already changed, yeah. but it does feel like that challenge is some way off being solved. And, you know, it's a little bit like some of these uh, banking systems that we've come to know. You know, they've mm -hmm. become very uh, big, archaic type systems in a sense, and to, to iterate and change is not as easy as, as one would think. Um, so one, you know, ETFs is a listed share, and that comes with a whole lot of features and a whole lot of good stuff. And then unit trusts actually also have a few good things that ETFs don't have. For instance, you can buy half a unit of a, of a unit trust. You can't buy half a unit of an ETF. Sure. So, so there are little things like that that make the, the system collaboration um, between the two ecosystems quite, quite um, difficult. And so advisors, when they're wanting to give advice on ETFs, they need to also have the tool set and the administration functionality that helps s support that. And I guess for the clients, they're just left feeling quite frustrated because, you know, they want the best of both worlds, sure. uh, don't they? And there are one or two platforms in the market now that are giving the best of both worlds. Um, and I think that hopefully through time, the bigger platforms uh, will, will also move in that direction. Grant, how are you dealing with the challenge of uh, access? Is it a challenge in your world? And uh, what's your view on perhaps reducing a uh, few barriers that seem to be present in the market? So I think, <clears throat> and I agree with you, I mean, Gareth's absolutely right. The entire ecosystem was designed to work with an off-market trading unit trust world. So, you know, incorporating a different method of, of entry using ETFs is something that the industry, the administration industry is grappling with. In our world, thankfully, our core platform can allow us to hold ETFs and unit trusts in a single contract. Mm -hmm. We don't use that functionality yet, but Why I think it is, it is something that we will build in over time. We actually have ETFs and shares inside the unit trust that is, tracks those indices. That's how we do it. But we are, are actually launching a product coming soon, which will be an investment straight into an ETF on our administration system. And I think the trend that Gareth talked about with regards building portfolios that consists of ETFs and unit trusts to hold the best of both worlds, 
I think is something that's going to happen in the future, and I think it's going to accelerate, if I'm yeah. honest with you. Uh, Morris, what about the issue of liquidity, particularly in the uh, markets that you uh, play in, uh, traditionally known to not be as liquid as the South African markets? How are you addressing that, and to what degree is that a challenge in terms of access? Yeah, so um, liquidity is, is twofold, um, okay. is that one, we've got a variety of markets with different liquidity profiles. Um, so now that we've got these two products out, we're able to see different uh, liquidity profiles across these asset classes. So while you have uh, African equity markets, which in total have about 1,000 listed companies, have a market cap of around 300 billion uh, US dollars, uh, the trading in those equities is sitting at around $8 million a day. So um, this is spread across the African continent, e including Egypt, including Nigeria and Morocco um, and those markets. By comparison, South Africa is something close to, uh, I don't even know the numbers, but I'm sure it's in the billions of dollars a day, um, mm -hmm. especially when you looked at what happened with NASPIS. But the euro bond market has a different liquidity profile because these euro bonds are actually issued in Europe, so Luxembourg and London, where your investors who are, uh, who are going after these assets uh, are always trading very active. And so you find that the, although the asset size is a lot lower, $100 billion, the liquidity in that is close to $200 million a day. So your euro bonds is quite more liquid than you have in traditional um, African equity markets. And so this is just one of the things that when you're on the JSC now and investors want to buy and sell, you have to make sure that your bids and offers really account for the liquidity in the, in the underlying. And that your spread also represents the cost that um, would be incurred, where African equity markets are a lot more expensive. I think they're the most expensive in the world. But your euro bonds, because they trade in Europe, they're quite cheap to buy also quite cheap to sell. So you have a much narrower spread on those ones. So is that the uh, role that the market maker plays then yeah. to ensure that? Yeah. So your bid offers, so the market maker is a simultaneous buyer and seller of the, of the ETF, uh, which is, I guess, when these platforms have been trying to uh, adopt ETFs onto their systems, they have struggled with because ETFs price intraday and unit trusts would price at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to buy the Alan Gray balanced fund, I would buy it, um, I would get the price at the end of the day. Whereas if I wanted to buy an ETF like a and p 500 or a Cloud Atlas ETF, I can look on the screen at that time and then just be able to, to quickly access it. So I think also with financial advisors to be a bit more uh, targeted with the audience is that their traditional customer um, who's aged may not be interested in, in accessing ETFs, but um, as Gareth has said, their children are already on platforms like Easy Equity. Mm. They're already trading ETFs. So with money that they get, they would be buying ETFs. They want to get exposure to healthcare, to, to equities, to Africa, et cetera. They're buying it. So the financial advisor may have to bridge that gap at some point um, to say, okay, how do I then include my client's children um, to, to provide them with support? New markets yeah, or yeah. New, new revenue avenue. Uh, gentlemen, one question that came out uh, quite prominently in part one of the series, and it's a question that we didn't really get uh, to answer, and it's actually a question that has come out uh, from one of the attendees, so thanks for bringing this to my attention, uh, is that the conflicts of interest between the role of the uh, financial advisor in the traditional form and now uh, the financial advisor being expected to uh, market these more efficient and more cost effective uh, products to uh, the client base essentially I mean is this not a case of these products uh, stealing their lunch as it were and Grant perhaps uh, maybe I begin with you and I begin with the question that has come from uh, one of the uh, attendees and thank you for your question and I do encourage uh, the rest of you to ask away uh, but uh, the question goes I personally invest in a couple of ETFs but uh, frankly I need to eat when are the ETF issuers going to share the spoils with IFAs? I imagine that's independent financial advisors. So I think, <clears throat> I think actually the spoils have already been shared in my view. I mean, the okay. ETFs bring down the cost of investing markedly. And, you know, as Jack Bogle said, every, every rand or every dollar you're not paying in fees goes into the compounding of your investment. Mm -hmm. So if I understand the context of the question correctly, um, you know, my understanding is, is that the 
you know, accessing ETFs in a portfolio brings down the, can bring down the total cost of investing. You know, that's good for financial advisors and that's good for clients because yeah. financial advisors can have their margins protected. The value of their advice is then, in, you know, is sort of uh, paid for. But of course, the total cost of investing goes down. There's more available for the client. So I actually think, to be honest with you, that there's no conflict of interest when incorporating a lower cost investment strategy. And, and I think that, you know, the, the one argument that I've heard a few times as well, you know, and this is a very unforgive me because I'm speaking to the converted on this panel is that no passive investing, you know, won't outperform active investing or the South African markets inefficient. You know, I think in, in some cases, I'm not saying that that's not true. But for the vast majority of investors, where you spend your time is really around getting the asset allocation decision correct. And one of the most efficient ways to implement an asset allocation decision is to use an index to do it because it's a set of rules. One of the most efficient vehicles to do it with is an ETF yeah. when you want that instant diversification. So I actually think this is a free lunch coming, ev coming, coming everyone's way. Mm -hmm. uh, free lunch or yeah. is someone's lunch been eaten here? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with Grant. I think, you know, if you sit, if a financial advisor sits with a family and gives f financial advice and produces a quote at the end of that process for what that's going to cost, mm -hmm. there, there are three components to that quote. There's what the investment manager is charging, so the likes of Cloud Atlas and mm -hmm. CoreShares to say, okay, uh, this is what this particular investment strategy is going to, to cost. So let's say they're investing in the CoreShares top 50 product. That is 20 basis points is the management fee there. Then there is the platform component or the administration component that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. and that will typically have a cost. And then there is the advice component. Now, when they are segmented neatly, if you, as the advisor, are helping the client reduce the investment component, well then actually you're doing the, the client a favor mm -hmm. and there's no conflict. You're going to carry on charging whatever it is that you planned on charging or whatever you've agreed to charge with the client based on what you believe your value proposition is in that particular uh, context. So, so there are three different charges. And so there's no conflict. I think in days gone by, or rather decades gone by, the advisor would perhaps position their value proposition as being, well, we really think that Old Mutual has got the best equity strategy at the moment. Therefore, mm -hmm. you know, invest with uh, Old, Old, Old Mutual. And then the client might have said, but why don't I just buy the top 40? And that, in that context, the advisor might have felt sort of undermined. Yeah. Um, but actually, the advisor responding to that question by saying actually the top 40 is a perfectly good investment mm -hmm. or maybe in this instance it's not, you know, that, that advice is still valuable and must still be charged for whether the client is going with the old mutual product or the simple top, top 40 product. Uh, so I concur with Grant completely. I, I think there has been a narrative built, uh, sadly so, in the passive market that it's somehow anti-advice or anti-intermediation. Uh, when in fact it's not at all. Um, I think the ETF issuers desperately need advisors to guide clients and say, well, how much of my portfolio should be in African securities versus U.S. securities and so forth? And for that, they must be charged. Uh, they, they must charge a fee. Yeah. Right. yeah. Also nodding there, so I imagine yeah. that you're also in, a, in agreement with your fellow yeah. Uh, panelists. Yeah, to to a large extent, and um, you know, I always think of 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 the late Alan Gray who once said. Uh, he wants his cake and he wants to eat it too, you know, and when you look at the... Can the you do that? <laughs> We've been told you well, can't. <laughs> it seems possible. <laughs> but when you look at the, at the sphere of, of exchange traded funds, I mean, our biggest partnership, our quarterback should really be um, the financial advisors, you okay. know, who are giving the products out there. Uh, to their clients to, to use in their portfolios. But if they're not then adequately remunerated, mm -hmm. because we operate in a low cost environment, so we are like, as Gareth once said, budget airlines <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to some extent. So they, we don't necessarily maybe have those resources to plow back to the financial advisors, but potentially being on a platform and where ETFs are available, the financial advisor can receive some kind of um, incentive to participate in distributing to ETFs, which they already, to, from what I remember or recall, used to receive from actively managed unit trusts or traditional unit trusts. 
So that model um, needs to really come to life or to fruition to some extent so that financial advisors can say, okay, fine, I've given Cloud Atlas an allocation, but I'm able to realize some kind of basis points rebate uh, for putting my clients' funds there. So you say the model needs to come uh, alive. Uh, what's holding it back at this stage? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Grant may know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. We already have things like um, cryptocurrencies that are out there, blockchain, et cetera. But we still have, like they said, the administration systems are still very archaic and still very much using language from the 80s. Um, so when we've got systems like FinSwitch and those type of mm -hmm. technology languages, um, I think the platforms and the lists should really adopt that type of technology and be able to offer um, these ETFs simultaneously with unit trust mm -hmm. and so that the financial advisor can say to the ETF issuer, I would like to distribute your products and they can make arrangements there. All right. Yeah. I, I must just add, like I think <clears throat> where, where I, um, I may differ ever so slightly, I actually think that the role of the advisor with this sort of abolishment, this almost the impact of RDR that whilst we haven't fully implemented in South Africa, this, this impact of clarifying the fee RDR? models, the retail distribution review, okay. which is effectively one of its main jobs is to disentangle the incentives in the industry. And whilst that's been in, in place since day dot, uh, those, those, and uh, you know, there might even be some grandfathering arrangements that exist at the moment, but I think that when, once you once you sort of disentangle that, it actually frees up a financial advisor to truly show their value to clients. You know, when we've seen what we run, what is an automated financial advisor, and we've spent years building these simple algorithms. They're not complex algorithms, but they are incredibly difficult to build on an integrated way. If you were to able to value that advice, I think that there'd be a, and, and sort of clarify its role, I think that the, the ex using, of, the, using of, uh, of a cheap way to use index allocation doesn't become a threat at all. And I think in, in many ways, it's a benefit to the financial advisor because there's this clarity about what's actually happening with my investment, this transparency of roles. And look, at it, certainly, and it is the case, I think, in, that it, that's in some cases, they may be necessary to push ETFs as, a, as the tool it needs to be. Um, but I do think long term, I think, you know, for financial advisors, I, I think it's actually a rosy future. Right. Uh, can I just also ask, uh, what then do you guys think is the uh, role of the, uh, the robo-advisor in a South African context? And how do you see that uh, growing in the foreseeable future? Uh, um, for, I'll just answer briefly, but um, I do feel that the robo-advisor should assist, as Grant Juan said, to, to help clients with allocation because we've got 84 ETFs, um, different asset classes, different offerings. So if I'm saying my client has a requirement to save for their retirement or for their kids' education, mm -hmm. then that robo-advisor, in my opinion, should assist the, the financial advisor to construct an ETF portfolio that then can achieve those outcomes with whether it's volatility, it's risk, it's uh, diverse exposure, et cetera, but to allow them then to achieve that and, and then do it um, independently, if I, can, if I can say. So as opposed to the robo-advisor advising the client of the financial advisor, I think that's where the, the misunderstanding has been in the past where um, financial advisors have felt, have felt that this is going to take over their job, mm -hmm. but it's actually not, it should be a tool they yeah. use to enhance. All right. Uh, we have some more questions coming through from the audience, and uh, I suppose it's, it's best that we take them to uh, make sure that we answer as many as possible. Uh, there's a question that's uh, about the bid-ask spread. So I imagine it's talking about liquidity. Uh, the question goes, why are bid-ask spreads on South Africa domiciled ETFs so extremely wide? Large bid-ask spreads and limited liquidity in ETFs is a major barrier to confidence in advising a client into ETFs. Gareth, would you like to take this one? And anyone else would like to answer, please uh, just feel free. Um, so I would probably start off by saying that we don't think it's that wide. Um, All right. I think the, the, I mean, obviously, there might be points in time in a trading day where a client might feel that it's, it, it's, it's wide. We work very hard to actually try and ensure that that bid offer 
spread um, is as narrow as possible. Um, I think it's important to point out that it's, it's not in the product house's interest, it's not in our interest as core shares, for instance, for clients to be dissuaded by a wide bid offer spread. We want clients to invest in the product. And so it's, it's our deliberate kind of desire to, to have that spread as narrow as possible. Mm -hmm. There are some costs, though, uh, involved in the trading of ETFs that do need to be recouped. Uh, so the market maker who's helping us ensure that there's liquidity in the ETF um, has got some costs in terms of that particular function. And the underlying shares that we are buying all have a bit off a spread. You know, that, that's the great irony. So, so if you have an, e an index with share A, B, and C, and your ETF is representing share A, B, and C, as a starting point, your bid offer spread has to mirror what the underlying bid offer spreads are, if you can imagine that. Um, so there, there, there's certain structural reasons for that bid offer spread to be there, uh, and there's certain costs that need to be recouped mm -hmm. inside the bid offer spread. But it's certainly not in anyone's interest for that to be wide, and it's not some you know, hidden agenda or anything like that. I think the issue is desperately want clients to trade, and they want those instruments to be liquid uh, and so forth. Uh, and so we work hard actually to try and reduce that bid offer spread. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, wide or not so wide in your view, Grant? <coughs> it's probably a question better for Maurice than I. I mean, in my view, I'm kind of with Gareth on this. The, it's, it's just a function of offering an intraday price means that someone's got to have that ability to offer you that either that sell or that buy. In order to do that, that market maker mm -hmm. and that function has got a range of costs. And, and I think it's right in saying that even securities transfer tax are, are probably included on that where you're buying local shares. But I think Maurice is probably better, better pointed yeah. actually than, than me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I also enjoy trading as a pastime. So uh, you do monitor some stocks and what's a decent number of a bid ask spread? So uh, America, the US has, has lower ones. They're close to single digits, five to eight. Uh, South African and South African ETFs can also have that if they, if they have a sufficient market maker. Uh, but they can go high. Um, they can go to 50 basis points. They can even go to, into the percents, like 1%, 1.5%. Um, even in, in Africa where we trade, we see, or let me, we're in Africa, but in other countries where we <laughs> trade, um, there, there, there's bid uh, offer spreads which can go into double digits um, in some stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's then a function of liquidity. But what is really fundamental is that you do have a market maker who's there who can be sent an email or a call to say, look, I'm seeing this, I want to enter a position. Uh, can you give me a, a price or a better price? And that's their job is to facilitate the client then being able to transact um, in that mechanism. It's not, it's not anything we can run away from, um, but I think your efficiency in terms of achieving that basket in the ETF is far better than if you were to try uh, trade all of those underlying stocks yourself and try achieve the same uh, bid ask spread if you were to trade yourself. So you actually yeah. get the basket at a, at a far better price in the ETF than you do going individually into each stock. Mm -hmm. I, th I think if I could perhaps also add, I think the, you know, the bid offer spread and the liquidity of the ETFs is quite a technical component really of buying an investment. I think if you think about your investment process, whether you're an advisor or, or direct investor, the liquidity and some of these finer details of the actual trading process should sit very far down in your overall thought process around how you're approaching the investment. I mean, you should be thinking about kind of other, you know, is it the right investment for you in the first instance? Have you, have you put that index together? Is, is it the right investment in the context of your financial plan? So to start with the bigger picture mm -hmm. kind of items before you get too flustered around really quite technical uh, components. In fact, you know, um, Jack, Bogle, who Grant cited earlier, who's the sort of the father of index investing and kind of promoted this long-term approach to, to index investing, he actually didn't like the ETF construct from a point of view that it allowed for this intraday trading. Because mm -hmm. he said, well, why would, you ever, why would you ever buy an equity investment and want to sell it later that day? And he's 100% right. You should be in buying an equity investment for five years, but probably a better 10 years plus. Mm -hmm. And in that context, you know, whether you're paying 30, 40 basis points, less than a percent on, on these minor details really doesn't actually make a lot of difference over, over the very uh, long term. So I, I would encourage clients not to get 
sort of bamboozled by some of this jargon and, and don't let it fluster you when, you when you're approaching the ETF market. I think get the fundamentals right first. Think about um, what portfolio of ETFs you're going to be putting together and why and, and how that fits your financial plan. Um, and then, you know, right at the end, sort of maybe, maybe not get worried about some of those liquidity aspects. All right. I think that uh, answer has been sufficiently answered, or that question rather has been sufficiently answered. Another question um, from a, an anonymous advisor who uh, says that he is uh, starting to uh, feel a bit redundant. Uh, oh, by the way, the viewers say great insights. Uh, so well done, gentlemen. <laughs> but uh, this anonymous advisor does say he's starting to feel a bit redundant, and it can only get worse as DFMs increasingly do the product analysis on IFA's behalf. Uh, who'd like to take that one and just assure the advisor there? I was going to say Grant might <laughs> well, well, Passing the back. <laughs> Passing well, the I'll back. Take it, I'll, I'll take it, but yeah. I, you know, well, I won't let, let someone else go first. Or perhaps I'll all of you can chip in. Okay, okay. I'll have a first stab. Firstly, I think that advisor should actually go and sit with the DFMs and have a cup of coffee because I think they'll, they'll soon find out that the DFMs actually want the advisor's business and want to collaborate together uh, in helping the client find uh, a solution. So, so DFMs are just really helping advise. I mean, if you're a financial advisor, there are like 200 asset managers all shouting at you at the mm -hmm. same time mm -hmm. saying that their product's the best. And you're like, well, goodness me, I've also got to go see Mr. Smith this morning mm -hmm. and da -da -da -da. You know, you've got a busy day. So sure. all the DFMs are doing is help consolidate all that noise and put solutions together with, with products, and then the advisor gives advice on the solution rather than on the individual funds. So I don't think the advisor is being um, undermined by, uh, by the DFM uh, uh, market uh, at all. So there's another part to how they felt redundant. Um, Aside from DFMs, there was another component to it. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, doing the uh, product analysis on IFA's uh, behalf. Oh, okay. I think you, yeah, I think right. you got it. Okay. Yeah, Grant. So I think from my point of view, I, you know, I mean, I, I run a robo advisor, and that's often what we get accused of doing is is making financial advisors redundant. But the truth is, you know, we actually partner with financial advisors yet now. So I think what you're doing is that with the uh, the advent of these, you know, the DFMs. The fact that you can now have a DFM creating tailored portfolios for your client base, you know, we use Unitrust, but that, you know, it's kind of the same function. And then you've got automated advice. What we're actually doing is helping an advisor scale their business, helping them make sure that the base quality of advice to all of their clients they can focus more on. And I think that, you know, reducing the administration, the compliance burden for financial advisors, actually allows them to focus more on the needs matching, the ongoing financial advice for more clients. So I actually think it's actually a very exciting time to be a financial advisor. My personal view is that, you know, over the next, you know, 15 to 20 years, we're going to see a boom in the growing numbers of people entering the financial advice space, and it hasn't been the case for many years. And I think these, this sort of changes, this evolution of the players in the industry supporting the financial advisor are going to help them scale massively. So I, I really, if anything, I think a financial advisor is even more important as the complexity grows in our industry, as the compliance burden grows, um, I think that financial advisors become more important. Mm -hmm. And Maris, I take it you agree. Um, There's do, a lot I of do. consensus on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do, and I think one thing I would say to, to that IFA is that, well, come over to the ETF world. Um, we won't do that to you. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that I also believe that uh, open source uh, exchange traded funds, if I can call it that uh, as an early term, are probably going to start coming to the table a lot sooner um, than, than we would expect, where IFAs can then actually create their own uh, exchange traded fund, which they could distribute to their network or, um, or distribute to, to a wider audience. Whereas your, your DFMs, your discretionary fund managers, are typically have 101 portfolios, and it's only in their best interest to find a way to align or combine those portfolios mm -hmm. on behalf of clients, whether that's IFA or an institutional investor. So I would say that, you know, um, come over, take the, 
take the red pill uh, <laughs> 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 and you know come over to the ETF side and I think this open source ETFs is going to be something something to talk about right yeah. just revealing your age there <laughs> I wonder how much of the younger audience know what you made reference to <laughs> uh, I don't know of course <laughs> <laughs> hashtag matrix uh, but uh, Grant one question that we didn't um, discuss in full detail perhaps is the, that of costs right and uh, whether ETFs are really cheaper than traditional collective investment schemes and just just added to that, uh, you know, when one should use a note rather than an ETF. Well, I think I think you know. Let's. I mean, maybe just sticking with uh, that. I mean, that's a big discussion on its own. When a yeah. unit trust is cheaper than an ETF, I think the narrative is automatically that it, that an ETF is cheaper than a unit trust, and it certainly is something that you do need to be aware of. And I think one of the key reasons that they they sort of automatically seem to be cheaper as a lot of unit trusts in the market are still actively managed and they generally come at a higher management cost. Um, and whereas the ETF market is at this stage completely passively managed which automatically comes at a cheaper cost. There's also obviously the entry points are different. So the way that you get into an ETF is you go through the exchange traded um, administration. So you go through brokerage, you pay straight, you pay investor protection levy, there's a bid ask spread on going in as well. And sometimes it's, you, you don't always, it's not always simple to make the comparison between a round trip cost into an ETF and a round trip cost into a, a unit trust. So I think that, that's something that I think advisors just need to be aware of. You know, I mean, I, you know, I was actually chatting to Narina just before this call now because I wanted to make sure that I, I had this correct. And in her view, over the long term, an ETF will still be cheaper than a unit trust because in a unit trust, what tends to happen is that you are, in, in effect, uh, subsidizing the transaction costs of other investors inside a unit trust when you do so. Um, you know, m my feeling is that it's, it's a, probably the, the vehicle itself, when the unit trust and the ETF, and I think as Gareth made the point, rather focus, the, the bigger decision is what does your client need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you get that right, implementation between a unit trust and ETF, the cost differential, probably less of a concern to you as a financial advisor, or it's lower down on the priority list, let's put it that way. Yeah. And just, just a quick thing on notes, I mean, I, I'm no expert on notes, I just think that there are interesting ways in which you can invest small sums of money to gain access to international exposure with, with or without the currency. And of course, you can um, get way, access to a wide range of quite interesting investment exposures from single stocks to other types of, of interesting investment propositions. The only thing you've got to be aware of is that you don't, um, the underlying effect of your, your risk is to the issuer of the note. There's a, a credit risk effectively to that. But uh -huh. I think that's quite low in, South, in the South African context. Okay. Want to add anything? No, I think Grant's covered it. Covered nicely, it. Yeah. There's another question that has come uh, through just regarding a uh, uh, strategy and uh, how ETFs perhaps can be used for things like a hedging or being an effective hedging tool. Would anyone like to take that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, when you look at what you're hedging against, uh, it's, it's an important thing because hedging is usually something that would apply to institutional investors and, and, and pension funds where they like also matching their liabilities with the assets, et cetera, and wanting to hedge against inflation mm -hmm. or hedge against their uh, RAND exposure or the fluctuation of the RAND dollar exchange rate. So ETFs now, they're all priced in RANDs as it, as it presently stands. So when you're looking at your currency hedging, you may not see that thinking, okay, this is a RAND instrument. But a lot of the ETFs now are, uh, some of them are feeder funds, but others are investing in assets which are abroad. So you can hedge for currency risk because your underlying investment is actually held offshore. Um, and with ETFs, it also provides a nice dispensation because um, investors, individual investors, can put as much as they want without hitting exchange control limits, where if you were to buy physical Tesla shares or a physical S&P 500 units um, in America, you'd have to use your foreign allowance. But if you buy them now on the JSC, you're able to externalize a lot more money and potentially hedge your exposure to uh, local securities, uh, JSC securities, uh, South African government bonds, etc., and be invested offshore, but they are still priced in rands. Mm. All right. um, so, 
Yeah. Just a quick one, uh, feeder funds and non-feeder funds, uh, what's the yeah. difference there? So feeder funds is where um, a, an ETF issuer in South Africa um, feeds into an ETF that's issued abroad. So it could be a uh, feeder fund to uh, an, an S&P 500 that's issued by iShares or a BlackRock. It makes it a lot more efficient because when you are investing there, you're getting economies of scale as a South African um, ETF issuer, and you're also benefiting as an investor from the exchange control approval. Whereas other funds like, and these funds, again, going a bit more technical, are the ones which should have a bit of a higher bit of a spread, are funds which then physically go and buy shares in these underlying markets. Like we do that in, in our two funds. We physically go in, into the country and we buy the shares there, um, and also the bonds uh, abroad. So that's the difference between the two, um, but ultimately, you know, they achieve the same objective of creating a basket. All right. So just uh, going into closing comments, uh, gentlemen, if we may, uh, what would your key takeaways uh, be uh, that you'd like uh, some of the viewers to walk away with uh, today? Uh, Gareth, not passing the back. <laughs> I'm starting with you here. Yeah. So, so I think that the biggest um, message that we are trying to communicate to the okay. advice market at the moment is that um, passive funds, whether they CIS funds or unit trusts, traditional unit trusts, or whether they ETFs, help lower the cost of the investment part of uh, the process. And they're not um, anti-intermediaries. So actually, we, we want advisors to give advice on passive funds and their inclusion within a client's overall uh, solution. So any advisors who are feeling um, anxious about passive as relates to their profession. I think that anxiety is misplaced. I think that uh, there's a lot of value that they can add by including passive in their client solutions. All right. Grant? <clears throat> Again, I'm just going to agree with what Gareth said there. I, I mean, we use it in our own business. We use it to develop <clears throat> asset allocation-led um, investment strategies to help clients achieve their outcomes. I mean, that's what, Art, that's what Artfest does, and it helps financial advisors scale their practice. So. Again, I, I, you know, I think using passive, using it through an ETF or you know, using it through a CIS, I actually think it's a really bright future for financial advisors. And I think that's the, the emergence of these options for financial advisors helping their clients you know, even get more surgical about the kind of exposures they like. That's one of the beauties of ETFs is you've got almost these little tools that you can use to build in very, very specific, isolated investment exposures that maybe you didn't have that capability before. And yes, you might need a help from an ETF strategist to do it, but it certainly is something that I feel can help you benefit your clients a lot more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Last but not least, Maris. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's been a good opportunity to engage the market. And mm -hmm. um, from what the questions that were asked, it's pretty obvious that the financial advisors do have a good understanding of exchange-traded funds, um, and they've asked very technical questions, which, which is good. So I think the point is there needs to be some kind of handshake uh, going forward between financial advisors and uh, JSE ETF issuers so that this market can grow because it is, um, at the end of the day, where the world has already headed um, mm -hmm. and is sitting on the side of ETFs globally. Then I think South Africa is going to be moving there uh, fairly soon. So we are sitting with the situation where um, ETFs are the future, but the future um, is here. And it's, yeah, it's been quite pleasant then to engage with the, with the IFAs and, and hear the, the questions that they had to ask. All right. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I think that's uh, what has come out uh, from or my key takeaway that has come out quite strongly, just uh, you know, recapping what happened with part one and part two, is that uh, things have changed. Um, and we certainly cannot go into this future that's here today by doing uh, the things that we did uh, yesterday. We have to embrace the change. Uh, I was also of the camp that the robo-advisor was actually uh, stealing from the lunch of the traditional financial advisor, but you have opened up the, um, the can of opportunity, as it were, talking about the fact that there will be more uh, demand for the skill sets of, of both, but it's about learning how to work together a lot more to, to ensure that everyone eats 
eats, hey? Uh, who wants to go hungry? Uh, but uh, thanks so much also once again to you and your wonderful engagement with the audience and your, your great feedback. We certainly do appreciate that. Uh, that does wrap up the uh, second part of this investment dialogue that was specific for financial advisors. I can tell you that the uh, next uh, series that will be coming up will be for the retail uh, investor and that will be looking more closely at taking control and exploring ETFs as a tool to build uh, your portfolio and build your wealth. That uh, conversation happening on the 28th of September, so uh, not too far away from one o'clock to two o'clock. So hopefully uh, many of you will still also be able to join. I'd like to thank the uh, JSC and the BDFM obviously for providing this platform for us to learn and share insights and uh, become a little bit more educated. The participants are on the stage of course for their time and also their valuable uh, financial education that doesn't get uh, unnoticed in this environment and yourselves once again for giving us your time this morning. I wish you all a great day further and until next time we meet. Goodbye.